Hello everyone and welcome to Metacaucus video series where we'll explore some high yield USMLE step one recall questions. In this video, we're focusing on asthma, which is one of the most commonly tested topics on the USMLE exam. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder characterized by airway hyper-responsiveness, reversible airflow obstruction, and um, airway inflammation. Let's go through this detailed visual representation of the pathogenesis of asthma, which illustrates how the immune system responds to allergens and leads to asthma symptoms. This image is broken down into three key phases, initial exposure and repeated exposure, which contain early phase and late phase reactions. First, let's talk about what happens during the initial exposure to an allergen. In the left panel, we see that when an allergen, such as pollen, enters the respiratory tract, it is captured by dendritic cells. These dendritic cells present the allergen to T helper 2 cells. In response, the T helper cells release interleukin-5, which is crucial for the recruitment of eosinophils, key inflammatory cells in asthma. At the same time, Th2 cells release interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, which activate B cells. These B cells then produce IgE antibodies, which prime mast cells by binding to IgE receptors on their surface. This initial sensitization process sets the stage for the exaggerated immune response upon repeat exposure to the allergen. Now, moving to the early phase, immediate reaction, in the middle panel, we see what happens when there is a repeat exposure to the allergen. The allergen interacts with IgE on the surface of mast cells, causing the mast cells to degranulate. This degranulation releases inflammatory mediators like histamine and leukotrienes, which trigger bronchoconstriction, a hallmark of an acute asthma attack. Bronchoconstriction leads to the characteristic symptoms of asthma, shortness of breath, wheezing, and chest tightness. Along with bronchoconstriction, these mediators also cause vasodilation, leading to increased blood flow and furthering inflammation in the airways. Finally, let's look at the late phase on the right, which happen hours later. This phase occurs several hours after the initial exposure and is characterized by the recruitment of additional inflammatory cells, including eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils. Eosinophils release toxic proteins like major basic protein, which cause damage to the airway epithelium. This leads to ongoing airway inflammation and contributes to chronic changes in asthma, such as airway hyperresponsiveness and remodeling. This phase is critical because it can cause more severe and prolonged symptoms, even without continued exposure to the allergen. In summary, asthma starts with allergen sensitization and IgE priming during the initial exposure. On repeat exposure, the early phase involves mast cell degranulation causing bronchoconstriction and vasodilation. The late phase then brings in more inflammatory cells, leading to persistent airway inflammation and further exacerbating asthma symptoms. This whole process underscores why managing inflammation with medications like corticosteroids is crucial in preventing asthma attacks. Let's start with a quick overview of this diagram, which outlines how we use pulmonary function testing to differentiate between obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. The first key parameter we look at is the FEV1 over FVC ratio. A low ratio indicates obstructive disease, meaning there's difficulty getting air out of the lungs, while a normal or high ratio points toward restrictive disease where lung expansion is limited. After determining if a disease is obstructive or restrictive, we evaluate the diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide or DLCO to further narrow down the diagnosis. In obstructive diseases, if the DLCO is normal or increased, we're typically looking at asthma, whereas a decreased DLCO suggests COPD, specifically emphysema. In restrictive diseases, a normal DLCO might indicate chest wall weakness, while when it get decreased, it suggests interstitial lung disease. Now let's focus on asthma. Asthma is a classic example of an obstructive lung disease. It presents with a low ratio of FEV1 over FVC, indicating airflow limitation, primarily during expiration. What makes asthma unique 
compared to other obstructive diseases like COPD is that in asthma, the DLCO is typically normal or increased. This is because in asthma, the problem is with the airways rather than the alveoli, so gas exchange at the alveolar level remains intact. Asthma is characterized by reversible airway obstruction. That's why patients can experience normal lung function between asthma exacerbations. With proper treatment, such as bronchodilators and inhaled corticosteroids, airflow can be restored and patients can regain normal FEV1 and ratios of FEV1 over FVC. This reversibility is one of the key distinctions between asthma and COPD, where airway obstruction becomes more permanent over time. Let's begin with a series of cases to help clarify how asthma presents and how it's managed. First case we have here is a 42-year-old woman who has had episodic shortness of breath and cough for several months. Her sputum analysis reveals eosinophils, and she has no significant history of smoking or other medical conditions. The critical clue in this case is the sputum eosinophils, which point directly to allergic asthma. One of the most common triggers of allergic asthma is exposure to house dust mites, a frequent cause of indoor allergies. For the exam, it's crucial to recognize that eosinophilic inflammation is a hallmark of allergic asthma, and house dust mites are a common culprit. This case highlights how environmental allergens can trigger asthma symptoms through a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction where eosinophils and IgE play central roles. Now, let's move to the next case, which features a 34-year-old man who presents with episodic dyspnea, wheezing, and chest tightness that started a few months ago after beginning work at an automotive painting shop. Interestingly, his symptoms improved during a two-week vacation to Arizona only to return when he went back to work. His lung examination and chest x-ray are normal, and office spirometry shows no obstruction. So now, what's happening here? This man is suffering from occupational asthma, triggered by inhaled allergens at his workplace, most likely isocyanates from the automotive paint. Occupational asthma is a common cause of adult onset asthma and can be either immunologic or non-immunologic. In this patient, his improvement during vacation strongly suggests an immunologic component as his symptoms disappeared when he was away from the workplace, a classic clue for diagnosing occupational asthma. For your exam, it's important to recognize that occupational asthma often involves IgE-mediated airway inflammation much like other forms of asthma. Normal spirometry between episodes does not exclude asthma, as the bronchoconstriction may be intermittent. Let's move on to a 24-year-old man with paroxysmal episodes of breathlessness and wheezing, which suggests asthma. His history of childhood eczema also raises suspicion of a topic, or extrinsic asthma, which is often seen in genetically predisposed individuals. The key finding here is the presence of eosinophils and charcoal Leiden crystals in the sputum. These granule-containing cells are recruited and activated by interleukin-5, a cytokine secreted by T-helper-2 cells. Interleukin-5 plays a critical role in eosinophil recruitment and activation in the bronchial mucosa, which contributes to airway inflammation and hyper-responsiveness. So it's important to remember how cytokines like interleukin-5 contribute to asthma's underlying mechanisms. This case emphasizes the importance of interleukin-5 in the pathophysiology of asthma, making it a high-yield concept for your exam. Now, let's look at a 43-year-old man who experiences occasional nocturnal dyspnea and cough after a severe respiratory infection. His pulmonary function tests are normal, but his history suggests that asthma is a possibility. So, how do we proceed to diagnose asthma in a patient with normal spirometry? This is where a methacholine challenge test comes in. Methacholine is a muscarinic cholinergic agonist that induces bronchoconstriction, and in patients with asthma, it will cause a greater than normal decline in lung function. 
The methicillin challenge is a high yield diagnostic tool for cases where asthma is suspected, but lung function tests are normal. This test helps to reveal bronchial hyperresponsiveness, a key feature of asthma. Be sure to remember this for the exam. Normal spirometry does not rule out asthma, and bronchoprovocation testing with methaclin is the definitive test in these scenarios. In another case, a 14-year-old girl with intermittent shortness of breath undergoes lung function testing, which shows a normal FEV1 over FVC ratio. Despite this, her symptoms suggest asthma. To definitively rule out asthma, a negative methaclin challenge would be most helpful. Methaclin induces bronchoconstriction in patients with hyperreactive airways, so a negative test effectively excludes asthma. This concept is a must-know for the exam. Even if spirometry is normal, asthma can still be present, and a bronchial challenge test is necessary to confirm or exclude the diagnosis. Methicolin challenge tests have a high negative predictive value, meaning that if the test is negative, asthma is very unlikely. Moving to another case, we meet an eight-year-old girl who is brought to the emergency department due to worsening shortness of breath and chest tightness over the past two hours. On physical exam, she is speaking in short sentences and has diffuse wheezing on lung auscultation. During her evaluation, she is asked to perform a peak expiratory flow rate test, and the results show a significantly lower than expected airflow rate. After receiving an inhaled medication, her airflow improves dramatically. So, what's the question here? How does the inhaled medication improve this patient's airflow? The answer lies in the medication's ability to relax the bronchiolar smooth muscle, which reduces airway resistance and allows more air to flow through the airways. This patient is experiencing an acute asthma exacerbation, which is essentially the result of acute bronchoconstriction. The medication she was given is most likely albuterol, a short-acting beta-2 adrenergic agonist. This medication works by binding to beta-2 receptors on the smooth muscle cells of the bronchioles, increasing cyclic AMP levels, which leads to smooth muscle relaxation and rapid improvement in airflow. This is a critical concept for you to remember for the exam. Albuterol is often used in acute asthma management because of its fast-acting ability to relieve bronchoconstriction, making it a first-line treatment during exacerbations. Understanding how beta-2 agonists increase cyclic AMP to relax the smooth muscles of the airways is a high-yield topic for step one. Next, a 32-year-old woman with a history of non-compliance to asthma medications dies after an acute asthma attack. Autopsy reveals hyperinflated lungs, airway mucus plugging, and cellular infiltration of the bronchial wall. Long-term use of inhaled corticosteroids like fluticasone could have prevented the chronic inflammation and airway remodeling seen here. Inhaled corticosteroids are essential for controlling inflammation and preventing severe exacerbations. For the exam, it's crucial to remember that non-adherence to inhaled corticosteroids can lead to fatal asthma exacerbations. Corticosteroids reduce airway inflammation and prevent the structural changes in the airways that worsen asthma over time. This case emphasizes the importance of long-term asthma control, a key takeaway for both step one and real-world practice. Okay, here's another case. We have a 21-year-old man with asthma who has been using inhaled glucocorticoids as part of his daily management, in addition to his rescue inhaler. While his asthma symptoms have improved, he's now presenting with white mucosal plaques in the oropharynx that can be easily scraped off, which are classic findings of oropharyngeal candidiasis, or a yeast infection in the mouth. This complication often occurs when patients are using inhaled corticosteroids. Why? Well, if the inhaler technique is poor, a lot of the medication can deposit on the oral mucosa instead of reaching the lungs, creating an environment where yeast can thrive. So how do we prevent this? The key here is to rinse the mouth thoroughly after each use of the inhaler. Additionally, using a spacer with the inhaler can help more of the medication reach the lungs, further reducing the risk of candidiasis. The correct answer to prevent oropharyngeal candidiasis is oral rinsing after inhaler use. This simple step can significantly reduce the likelihood of developing oropharyngeal candidiasis, a common issue when inhaled corticosteroids are not administered properly. 
Next, in this case, we have a 10-year-old boy with a history of mild, persistent asthma. His asthma was well controlled with inhaled glucocorticoids and a beta agonist. However, due to concerns about potential growth retardation linked to glucocorticoid use, his treatment was changed to chromalin. Chromalin is a mast cell stabilizer that works by inhibiting mast cell degranulation. When an allergen interacts with IgE on mast cells, it triggers the release of chemical mediators such as histamines and leukotrienes, which cause bronchoconstriction and inflammation. Chromalin prevents this release, making it useful as a prophylactic agent to prevent asthma attacks, but it is not used to treat acute exacerbations. Although less effective than inhaled glucocorticoids, chromalin can be beneficial in managing seasonal symptoms and exercise-induced asthma. The correct answer is, Chromalin stabilizes mast cells, preventing their degranulation and reducing the release of chemical mediators that trigger asthma symptoms. Finally, in the last case, a 42-year-old woman with severe asthma, characterized by frequent episodes of shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough, leading to hospitalizations and even mechanical ventilation. Despite using multiple inhaled and systemic medications, her asthma remains poorly controlled. To better manage her condition, the treatment regimen is expanded to include omalizumab, a monoclonal antibody that targets circulating IgE. Many asthma patients, particularly those with severe persistent asthma, have elevated IgE levels in response to environmental allergens like dust mites and animal dander. Omalizumab works by binding to the IgE antibodies, preventing them from attaching to IgE receptors on mast cells. Now, what does this accomplish? When IgE is blocked from binding to mast cells, it prevents the mast cells from releasing inflammatory mediators like histamine and leukotrienes, which are key drivers of airway inflammation. By inhibiting this pathway, omalizumab reduces airway inflammation, leading to fewer asthma exacerbations and improved control of the disease. So, the correct answer when asking about mechanism of action of omalizumab is decreasing airway inflammation. This mechanism is especially helpful for patients with asthma who don't achieve control with standard treatments, like inhaled corticosteroids and beta agonists. Thank you for joining this episode of the Metacaucus video series. Stay tuned for more high yield discussions on topics that frequently appear in your NBME and USMLE exams.